Hello fellow problem solvers, so today I'm going to be doing a problem, the legendary IMO problem number 6. I suggest you try it out for a minimum of 30 minutes, ideally 2 hours, but not more than 3 hours. If on your hand you'd like to go along with us, I suggest you take 10-15 minutes and put your first ideas out on paper. And start with the first problem solving principle. When you're confused and you don't know what to do, what should you do? We'll see soon. So now, let's begin. So, what the problem asks us is to prove that if AB plus 1 divides A squared plus B squared, where A and B are positive integers, then that this is a perfect square. And now, this is a wacky problem statement the moment you hear it, like if you haven't seen anything like it before. So, the first thing to really do is, you know, let's, if we don't know what to do, we play around with the problem. And here, let's play around, like, let's see what this gives us. So, AB plus 1 divides a squared plus b squared. Can we get anything play around with this? So for me, the first idea I was when trying to solve this is this divides a to the fourth plus a squared b squared. And the reason I make this is so that I can get rid of b entirely. So this plus one divides a squared b squared minus one because this is a b minus one times a b plus one. And now when you subtract this from this, you get a b plus one divides a to the power of four plus one. So now, you see, like, for fixed A, this thing right here is fixed. And then we get to pick the Bs. So now, let's explore and see, when we pick different A and Bs, what will we get as the square? Maybe there's a pattern that we can notice. And this is really the thing you do when you don't know what to do. You play around with small numbers, the problem-solving principle I've told you time and time again. You play around with small numbers and you see if you notice any pattern. So now let's do that. So just playing around a little bit tells you like you see the solutions for two. You have B is eight or zero, zero twenty-seven, zero sixteen for four, this for three. And you get the sense, wait, are these the only solutions? Like A A cubed A squared, A zero and A squared? Like, is this all there is to it? Like, it can't be right, can it? And the reason I'm thinking now. Like you try for four and for five, you get, I believe you get the same thing. And then you think, wait a second, is the, are these the only solutions? And I invite you to pause for five, 10 minutes and think about how would you check if whether or not these are the only solutions. And what it would mean for this to be the only solution is that for fixed A, the only B which satisfies this is either B is equal to A cubed or B is equal to zero. But there are loads of values as A grows large. Like, is this really that plausible? Like, it's possible, but I'm having a hard time accepting that at the moment. So then now let's look at, you know, how we check this hypothesis. Well, let's look at eight. It's the next cube. Let's see if these cubes give us something different. So for A equals eight, what do you get? I invite you to pause here for five, 10 minutes and figure it out, because here's what you get. So you get the number 4097. And the reason I knew immediately this was just by 17 is how? Well, I just switched A and B here, right? I know for B is equal to two. I know for A is two here, I got B is eight. So this is a solution. And now what is, now that gives me another different B. It gives me eight and eight cubed, eight and the cube root of eight, but it also gives me 30. And now what is k in each and every one of these cases? And k is 8 squared, 2 squared, 2 squared. And so for 30, so we have a different solution. We have 8, 2, and 30. Like, not 8, 2. And we have 8, 30, and 2 squared. So this is another one, another solution for k is 2 squared. Now we have, so we have two, eight, four, and we have a 30 and four. And now I ask you, do you see any connection between these numbers, between this triplet and this triplet? What is a connection that you see? And if, and I invite you here to come up with a couple of hypotheses and test them out generally, test them out for 27 see if the same hypothesis works out for you. Here's my hypothesis. 
So the question I asked myself, how can I get 30 from 8, 4, and 2? And for me, it was just immediate. Okay, wait, that's 8 times 4 minus 2. That's 30. Like, that gives me 30. Like, so what? And then I looked, what would be the general sort of case? Well, the general case would be that if I have a solution A, B, and K, then I can get another solution with B, and then I have B times K minus A and K again. Like that's what it would mean because I went from, what was it? It was two, eight, and four. And I went to what? I went to A, 30, and four. And now it's a matter of like, let's test this out. Is this actually the case or not? And when you test it out on free, what you get, I mean, when you test it out generally, actually, what do you get? You get this. And it's purely horror, <laughs> horror that you get once you plug in this and then you have this. And now you just plug in what K is, just plug in what K is. And once I saw this, I nearly gave up. But then I actually pushed on through, saw, okay, things actually cancel out very nicely. And you get that once you plug K in, you get A squared plus B squared over A B plus one. So now take five to 10 minutes and figure out what does this mean? We had a solution with A, B, and K, and now it seems if we have one solution, we have this solution as well. Now, does this go in the other direction as well? Does it matter like how we pick A and B? Here we picked B was actually bigger than A. What if B is smaller than A? Then what, what happens then? And I invite you to take five to 10 minutes and explore these questions. Here's the next sort of hint or big idea. So, if this is like your function, sort of think of it, from 284 you get to 834, and there you get to 30, 112, and 4. And when you check them out, they actually do work still. But if you switch the order, you're going down, you're going from 8 to 4, to 204, to 0 minus 24, to minus 2 minus 84, and now you'll go to from here. You can keep applying this and you'll get to the negatives here, the negative 8, negative 30, negative 30, negative 112. So it's going in the opposite direction, like it's going in the same direction, but negative. So now what does this process sort of mean for us? Like, what does it mean in terms of our problem? Like, look, if we have a solution, we're saying if we have this solution is K, then we can get a solution that's bigger or smaller. I mean. We're looking at the smaller solution and then at some point like what's happening here is we reach zero and then when we reach zero like you just have k is equal to a squared the final a so take that take that in that this process once you reverse it it actually goes like in reverse here so it goes both ways if you just switch the b and a like you can go to the bigger solution or to a smaller one. And now, what is enough for us to prove, to do to prove that k is always a square? Like, let's think about what's happening here in terms of our process. So if we have this like one solution, a and b, we can get another one. And if a is greater than b, then what we're really saying here is that when we do kb minus a, that this number will be smaller than a, right? Isn't that what's happening here? And if you try it out for free, it is what's happening. So now the question is, can we prove this? Can we use this somehow and go to a solution? And like, what's going to keep happening? Like if we keep applying this and say, like if we reach zero at some point, if we get a solution that's a zero and k, like our final a, all we have, we'll have a squared plus zero over zero plus one is equal to k. I mean, k is a squared. So that's how we can prove that k is a perfect square. And now with that, I invite you to try to go ahead and prove this is actually the case for the next 10 minutes. So here's the next step. So now we try to prove that if we have a greater than or equal to b is greater than zero, then that kb minus a is greater than or equal to zero and that it's strictly less than a. We assume the contrary for this side and we get an easy proof. 
But when we try to zoom the other thing, we get a little bit of a problem. It's, and the problem is this. We get that this can actually hold true if a is greater than b cubed. And now we have a problem. How will we ever deal with this? And I invite you to take five minutes and ask yourself, how will we deal with this? Is there anything we did previously that can help us here? And the answer is, well, remember, we get from ab plus one divides a squared plus b squared. What do we get? We get a b plus one divides a to the power of four plus one. And in the same way, we can get this divides a b plus one divides b to the power of four plus one. Now, if a was greater than b cubed, then we would have a contradiction, like this would be the contradiction. From here, we know this is true, b to the power of four plus one. And now if this was true, then this would be greater than, because they're both greater than or equal to zero, we would have, actually we're saying, yeah, strictly greater than zero now. Or wait, are we saying what? Yeah, strictly greater. So we would have this, and then here we would get that this is strictly greater than b to the power of four plus one. A contradiction. So this thing right here is a contradiction. So now we know that if a is greater than b, is greater, is greater than or equal to b is greater than zero, then another solution is kb minus a and b. That's our different solution. And it has the same k. And we know that kb minus a is less than a. And now the question is, how long can we keep applying this? And the answer is really, all up until the point where, like, if you think about it, like, we're always proving this is true. But we're assuming that b is greater than zero, that the smaller one is greater than zero. So at some point, the smaller one will be equal to zero. And there's a very easy way for us to prove this. And the way to do this is to, like, we're always sort of decreasing this pair. We're going from a, b to a pair that's smaller, that's k, b minus a and b. Now this is smaller than this. And then we'll keep doing this. And at some point we won't have, we won't be able to always keep doing this. And the way to show, to like see what happens at that place where we are no longer able to do this is to use the extremal principle and say, take the pair that's smallest. But how do you characterize the size of a pair? Well, you can characterize this one by the sum because one of the members is always the same. Like here B is the same, next time I think this one will be the same. So that's how we can characterize the size of this pair. So now what you do is on the next page, so we say that this is K for some A and we keep applying our transformation until we get the smallest pair, i.e. the pair with the smallest sum of the two positive integers and let that pair be a zero is greater than or equal to b zero is greater than zero. And from this, it follows that kb minus a zero needs to be zero. Otherwise we would have a smaller pair with this, with the same k. And now we plug in a zero is k times b zero. We plug that into the equation which has kept holding since the beginning when we were applying our transformations. And we get that this implies that k is equal to b zero which proves that k is a square. And this solves our problem. And this is like, I would never mentioned we had a jumping here. I never mentioned this like infinite, this like we did infinite descent. But the thing was, what we did was we said, we don't know what's going on here, as is usual with these types of problems. And then we played around, like got a couple of solutions. And then we noticed a pattern. We thought it was only going to be a, a cubed and a squared as a, b, and k. And then when we plugged in a square as like our base thing, and we saw that we got another solution. <laughs> we got 30. And from here, we tried to see, okay, is there like a pattern like this k, b minus a and b stay a solution with the same k? And that's what we did. And once we showed that, we only needed to show like what our intuition was telling us was that this whole thing was always decreasing and that it hit zero at some point. And once it hit zero, we saw that we would get what? We would get that K is the perfect square. And it's this, this last square right here is what K is. So this solves our lovely problem. And as always, thanks for problem solving.